Hentol Shinohara's Astra Lost in Space is a phenomenally well-crafted manga. It's this mind-blowing sci-fi thriller crossed with uplifting shonen comedy slash coming-of-age storytelling, and somehow it manages to pull this all off to spectacular effect. The series revolves around a group of high school students who get stranded in outer space and their struggles to return home against all odds. And at the beating heart of this manga lies an idea that sounds incredibly cliched when I say it out loud. Astra Lost in Space is a journey on multiple levels. What I want to do in this video is peel back all the layers of this journey metaphor and show just how powerfully this works as a structural device to make all the different facets of this manga come together. Hello, my name is Sean, and I break down what makes great stories tick. I usually don't give spoiler warnings in my videos, but this series is an exception. If the premise of shonen crossed with legitimately well-written sci-fi and mind-blowing reveals in only five volumes at all piques your interest, please go read this series before continuing. Astra contains perhaps the best plot twists I've ever seen in manga, and I really don't want to diminish their impact. Astra Lost in Space takes place in the distant future, where interstellar travel has become commonplace. We follow nine students who leave for a camping trip on an uninhabited planet. But as soon as they reach their destination, they're sucked through a wormhole and end up above a frozen planet in the middle of outer space. Luckily, they discover an abandoned spaceship and climb aboard. Still, they're three months away from home with barely any supplies. So there's no way they can travel back home in one go on the spaceship they dub the Astra. Instead, they map out an itinerary that will lead them to hop from planet to planet, allowing them to stock up on food and water for the next leg of their journey. Now, the journey is one of the most well-established literary metaphors. It's the idea that the physical distance traversed by the characters in a narrative corresponds to their personal development as well as the actual process of reading the story. Astra prominently establishes this idea at the very start of the series. Its characters start out 5,000 light years away from home, but as the story unfolds, they inch closer and closer to their destination, and thereby to the end of the manga. This literal journey through space is accompanied by two figurative journeys. First, the journey of the students growing from a group of complete strangers into a competence crew. And secondly, they journey from a state of complete bewilderment and confusion to the point where they discover the chilling truth behind their accidents. Both of these figurative journeys progress in a linear direction and correspond to the stages of the crew's physical journey. Each planet they visit offers a significant moment of growth for some of its characters, and at the same time, each trip offers further hints about the grand conspiracy that led them to be stranded in space in the first place. Now, you might be thinking that this is not an especially noteworthy observation. After all, having characters develop and learn new things over the course of a narrative is among the most basic elements of storytelling. But what sets Astra Lost in Space apart from most other narratives featuring figurative journeys is that in this series, the metaphor is palpable at every step of the way. Every light year that the Astra crew traverses, after all, is a testament to their progress. 
And when they eventually arrive home safe and sound, it's abundantly clear that they could only succeed in their journey because they grew into a cohesive group and because they uncovered the truth behind their disappearance. So, let's start with the group dynamics. In Chapter 1, the series protagonist, Kanata, introduces himself to his fellow students as their captain. Unsurprisingly, the others don't just take him up on his offer. Remember, at this point they're still total strangers to each other. Kanata later reveals that his dream is to become a space explorer with his own ship and crew. And so, he's treating this school trip as a precursor of sorts, with his bid to become captain looking like a move to advance his career. But once the Astro characters are transposed from the safe haven of planet MCPA to the depths of outer space, it becomes apparent just how arrogant Kanata's assertion truly was. While Kanata has the aura and the bravado of a typical shonen protagonist, he's unable to offer any concrete suggestions and only nods in agreement to what the others have to say. More than that, he turns out to be in the presence of Zack Walker, a child prodigy with a pilot license. In other words, Kanata's leadership failures are put into further relief through the contrast with the most overtly competent character in the group. All that Kanata has to offer is a series of cheap aphorisms like, as long as you move forward, you're making progress. They sound nice, but they don't actually offer any concrete value. And from the crew's side, there are multiple figures who don't fully integrate into the group yet. Some lack confidence in themselves. Others keep their distance from the rest. And some harbor massive secrets. But among them, one character receives the most significant amount of spotlight in the early parts of the story. At the start of this series, a girl called Quiteri claims that she's here only for the credit and has no interest whatsoever in becoming friends with the rest of the group. Moreover, she's the one who constantly challenges and undermines Kanata's authority, even after the group tentatively nominates him as their leader. So, when the Astra lands on planet Villiverse, there are two issues that need addressing. Kanata repeatedly falls short as a captain, and therefore needs to prove that he is worthy of the position, and Quiteri has to start playing her role in the crew. All these simmering conflicts finally come to a head when Quiteri's antics put her adoptive sister Phoenicia in danger. This is the moment where Kanata finally pulls through, risking his life to save Phoenicia. It's this moment that causes Quiteri to put her pride aside and truly become part of the group. At the same time, Kanata's split-second decision-making leads the entire crew to truly acknowledge him as their captain. In the following chapter, we're shown the direct results of this moment of growth. Once the Astra flies off from planet Villaverse, the characters have settled on a rhythm and routine aboard their spaceship. All this seems to flow from the events on their first alien planet. They have transformed from a gaggle of students into a functional crew, and this directly translates to making them progress on their journey. This general pattern repeats on each planet that the Astra crew visits. Each of their adventures causes certain characters to open up, reveal truths about their background, and fully integrate into the crew. Then there's the other figurative journey, that of discovering the startling truth 
behind their predicament. The manga sets up an immediate mystery with how they ended up 5,000 light years away in the first place. But right after the events on Villaverse, Zack reveals something that makes the plot thicken even further. The Astra's communication unit was deliberately sabotaged, and this act could only have been perpetrated by one of them. In other words, there's a traitor on board of this very ship. We'd just gotten the impression that the crew was starting to come together. But with this reveal, the manga pulls the rug out under our feet. And as the journey progresses, the hints keep piling on that these students are involved in something far more sinister than they could have ever imagined. For one, they discover that their disappearance was intentional. They were grouped together so that they'd be killed off in space. There are also a few peculiar common threads among the cast. There's a remarkable amount of characters with strange and difficult relationships with their parents, and many of them also reveal exceptional backgrounds and talents. All these plot threads finally come to a head on planet Icarus, the fourth stage of their journey. The first thing we learn about Icarus is that it's a planet where the same side is always facing the sun. And as a result, the planet is divided into a scorching hellscape where nothing can escape the relentless onslaught of the sun and a pitch black, frozen wasteland of eternal night. The planet's only inhabitable region is a slim belt in the middle of these two extremes, the twilight zone between perpetual day and night. And on a figurative level, these unique geographical features serve as a spatial metaphor on all three levels of the series journey. Within the actual events of the story, the planet's extreme environments caused the Astra to be caught in a storm and crash into a cliff. And as a result, the spaceship becomes completely and utterly incapable of interplanetary travel. And so, planet Icarus quite literally brings the Astra's journey to a halt. But at the same time, the manga uses environmental storytelling to reflect the mood among the crew. This is the moment where all hope seems lost. The crew is marooned on an alien planet with no hope of rescue. Here, more than ever, the crew's resilience is being tested. They are literally trapped between light and darkness, which figuratively symbolize their oscillation between hope and despair. So, it's a testament to the progress they've made so far that it's Olger, the one who was initially the most standoffish character in the group, who's the one to pull Kanata out of his rut. He calls out his captain to go back to his usual self and come up with some cliched survival tip like, you can't make progress if you're standing still. Olger here echoes Kanata's truism at the beginning of the story, that you can only make progress as long as you move forwards. What's notable in both of these scenes is that the seemingly shallow phrases ring true in a very literal sense. After all, the success of their mission revolves entirely around moving forward in space. Moreover, these are the two moments where the group is most at risk of remaining trapped in place. All this shows how closely intertwined the success of the group's journey is with their mental states. In both cases, 
the crew needs this kind of encouragement to get moving once more. Finally, this world of light and darkness is a really apt location for the most important revelation in the series. Over the course of the manga, the Astra characters have stumbled upon all these puzzle pieces, but they haven't quite managed to put them all together. They're not entirely in the dark anymore, but they haven't been exposed to the light of truth either. Right now, they're trapped in between, with no means to advance from this predicament. But then, they make an unbelievable discovery. There's another ship, just like the Astra, stranded on planet Icarus. Moreover, they find an astronaut inside, sleeping in a cryostasis pod. This astronaut is a woman called Paulina, and the Astra crew wake her from her slumber. Lina proves instrumental in solving many of the lingering mysteries that have been built up to this point. The ball is set in motion when she innocuously expresses her surprise that Quiteri and Phoenicia are not biologically related. After all, Phoenicia really is the spitting image of her adoptive sister. This is one of the many instances where the series at first seems to challenge our suspension of disbelief, only for this to turn out to be plot relevant much later. For us readers, the obvious similarities between Quiteri's and Phoenicia's designs make the reveal that their only adoptive sisters seem bizarre, and it's even more bewildering that none of the characters within the narrative points this out. At this stage, we can only rationalize this revelation by dismissing it as silly manga logic, or perhaps even bad writing. But then, 30 chapters later, our initial observations turn out to have been justified all along. These similarities between Quiteri and Phoenicia are revealed to have been a smoking gun that the manga had prompted us to dismiss. Paulina's observations prompt Quiteri to reflect on the issue for the first time, and Zack proposes to run a DNA test, mainly for shits and giggles. Nothing, however, could have prepared the Astra crew for what they would discover. Quiteri and Phoenicia are not sisters. They are the exact same person. More specifically, they share the exact same set of DNA. At this moment, all the pieces finally click into place for Kanata. Why are there so many peculiar familial situations among his crew, and why were they sent off to die in space? And then, there is also this Genome Control Act that kept rearing its head in the background, which is a law to mandate the collection of DNA samples. All of this turns out to have been connected. The Astra characters are in fact illegal clones, created for the sole purpose of giving their originals a second chance at life. But once the DNA Sampling Act passed into law, these illegal clones had to be disposed without any trace. Now let's go back to the manga story structure. This shocking discovery perfectly coincides with the moment that the Astra crew find a way out of their confinement on planet Icarus. As it turns out, Polina's spaceship is damaged in different places than their own. And so, they can actually repurpose components of the other ship to fix the Astra. In other words, the discovery of the second spaceship allows them to both resume their physical journey and to make a substantial leap in their journey to understand their 
predicament. And to take this connection even further, the Astra crew learns that they were clones as a result of discovering a ship that's identical to their own. You might say, a clone of the Astra. And when they dismantle Alina's ship to repair their own, they're doing something remarkably similar to the ships as what their parents had intended to do with them. Don't think too hard about the implications of this, I guess. In any case, from this point onwards, the Astra itself is a mirror of its crew of clones, with the components from both ships being merged together. Now, let me conclude with the one moment where the journey metaphor is brought out most powerfully. With the new parts in place, the Astra also regains use of its deep space telescope. And so, the crew can finally peer at their home planet. But to Paulina's shock, this planet is not Earth. With that, we get the series' second major plot twist. All of the original crew has never even heard of the Earth. They hail from planet Astra. Now, I don't want to bog this section down too much with all the plot and lore that explains this. Long story short, the Earth was predicted to be hit by a giant asteroid, and so the entire Earth's population migrated to a new planet. At that moment in time, humanity was eager for a fresh start, and so they essentially erased entire swaths of history, including the very existence of this interplanetary migration itself. But here's the kicker. The Earth was indeed hit by an asteroid and turned into a mass of ice. And this was the very location where the clones had been transported. Now it finally makes sense how they could have stumbled upon an abandoned spaceship in the middle of outer space. The Astra was a ship that was left behind in Earth's orbit. Now, this twist might seem like a nice way to just tie up some loose ends, but it's actually much more significant. This one reveal completely recontextualizes the series' underlying metaphor. All this time, the Astra crew was doing more than just traveling back home. They were, in essence, unearthing a grand conspiracy about nothing less than the fundamental nature of their reality. And they did so by retreading their forebears' voyage from Earth to Astra. In other words, their journey through space is also a journey from ignorance to truth because they'd actually witnessed the truth all along. And that's why, at the end of the story, the voyage of the Astra directly impacts the future of nothing less than all of humankind. When Kanata and his crew return home, they decide to expose the truth about their actual history. In effect, this second voyage from Earth to Astra reverses the trajectory of their predecessors' efforts, from falsehood to truth. And with that, the journey of Astra concludes with humanity moving forward as a whole. Astra Lost in Space is really a testament to how potent even an ostensibly simple idea can become. I hope to have convinced you that this journey metaphor unites every facet of this series and makes its ending much more powerful as a result. And if you liked what you saw, please consider subscribing for more in-depth manga analysis every other week. And as a heads up for my loyal followers, I'll now be taking a two-week break from YouTube for my summer holidays. So 
I'll see you again in four weeks time.